So the panelists are ready. We'll go on ahead and get started. Um, so just really quickly, and I apologize to all of the attendees, um, Zoom evidently is having a little bit of technical difficulty being able to see everyone who's on the panel, so I apologize about that. Um, my name is Amy Fitzpatrick, and I am the um, Director of Marketing for IVM and have been um, lucky to be a part of the E3 series um, since its inception, and I'm really excited about this one today, and I hope that you guys are too. So um, we will begin with um, Ms. Cynthia Tucker, who is our moderator today, introducing herself and then the panelists. And then after that, after our um, discussion is completed today, we will open it up to all of our attendees for Q&A. And if you look, if you've not been on one of these webinars before, another one um, for the Q&A session, if you scroll over at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a button for Q&A to where you can submit your questions there. Please feel free to also um, discuss anything that you would like or make comments in our chat session. So I'm going to go on ahead now and turn it over to the beautiful Miss Cynthia Tucker. And thank you, Miss Cynthia, for being here with us today. All right, thank you so much, Amy. I appreciate the introduction. And I apologize again that you're not able to see RV. And the second Cynthia is Joyce. Um, Joyce Levinston. So I again, apologize that you're not able to see their faces. Um, but at some point, I will make sure it's their panelists and I am, I will be moderating. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and just provide a little bit of background and information and definition on the words that we're going to be using today in our, in our series. Um, the two words are white privilege and allyship. So again, uh, my name is Cynthia Tucker. I'm the vice chair of IABM's Diversity and Inclusive Leadership Committee. I'm also the assistant director of Trojan Event Services at the University of Southern California. And before we get into the definitions, I would like to take the time for our panelists to also introduce themselves, starting with Joyce. Hi, everyone. My name is Joyce Leviston. I'm the senior vice president um, over convention centers for Spectra. I have approximately 30 years of convention center um, um, event management and convention facility management in the industry. Um, and I am excited about having this conversation with you today. Thank you. And my name is RV Bogus. I am the senior editor uh, for Venue Professional formerly Facility Manager Magazine at IVM. And um, I have been um, in this role with the association for about 20 years of the 35 years that we have had the magazine. So the industry is very dear to me. Uh, I also st serve as staff liaison to the Diversity and Inclusive Leadership Committee and have been pri privileged in that role for some uh, 10 to 15 years and have seen this committee um, I was about to say evolve, but maybe it's faster than an evolution uh, with what all great things are taking place within it. So it's an honor to be uh, on the panel today. Thank you, Joyce and RV. And once again, thank you for the foundation for allowing and having an E3 series and inviting um, our committee to participate on those. Um, this is uh, quite an interesting topic and we're gonna jump right into it. So first, what I'd like to do is provide the definition of privilege, and it's simply taken from Wikipedia. Nothing fancy about it, or fancy, you know, Harvard Business Review. But white privilege is the societal privilege that benefits white people over non-white people in some societies, particularly if they are otherwise under the same social, political, and economic circumstances. And it's completely taken from Wikipedia. Um, what we will do today is just kind of talk about the culture of power uh, because white privilege is when we say white privilege we're talking also about white power um, the culture of power represents a set of values beliefs and ways of acting that are unfairly and un unevenly privileged certain groups of people based on aspects of their identity what i wanted to do is just show what social media is portraying as white privilege. 
Um, so on the far left, you see white privilege is real, where we have two similar incidents um, that happen where one person gets four months in jail, where someone gets 12 years in jail, one being a person of color and one woman not being a person of color. In the middle, you see a confrontation with a police officer with a person of color running away that's probably going to be sh maybe shot in the back. Whereas the other confrontation with another, with a non-white person, non-black person actually holding their, their weapon. And it's, it's more of let's talk about it. Let's, let's not act so quickly. Let's, let's talk about, let's de-escalate what's going on. And then the other one is two women that were both graduates of a university that are breastfeeding um, with their cap and gown. One is considered controversial. The other is considered, oh, that's adorable. Also, white privilege, we're looking at this. I came across this meme, and, and it speaks volumes um, to say you have two people that are running a similar race at the same distance, with one person saying, what's the matter? It's the same distance. And not understanding that the woman of color has other boundaries and socioeconomic and, and other things that are going to make her race take a little bit more time. It's not the same. White privilege doesn't mean your life hasn't been hard. It means that your skin color isn't one of the things making it hard. Another topic that we're going to be talking about and I wanted to provide a definition of is allyship, taken also from Wikipedia. Allyship is the practice of emphasizing social justice, inclusion, and human, human rights by members of an in-group to advance the interest of an oppressed or marginalized out-group. This is a very busy slide, but I came across this slide and I really wanted to share just a few points where seven unmistakable signs that your allyship is performative. And that's the word what we're hearing now is that it's performative. It's more than just saying something on social media. It's actually followed with action. So one way that your allyship is performative is you have validation that drives your work. Secondly, you don't want to hijack the movement. You don't take up the space uh, that should be occupied by members of the community. If you don't, that you don't listen. These are, again, unmistakable signs that you are not being an ally, that you don't listen. Respectability is a condition. You never check yourself. None of us are perfect. Even the most well-intentioned of us slip and fall into problematic mess now and again. You act scary at the dinner table. If you show up at the Black Lives Matter rally with your no justice, no peace sign, but crickets are heard when you're sitting at a family table, for example, about white genocide, or you're not willing to risk anything. If you're not willing to sacrifice invest investments, both personal and professional, that conflicts with the values that you, that you promote. You're not an ally. At this time, I would like to introduce again our panelists. And we have a few questions that have been drafted to lead our discussion. Once again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put that in the chat box. And Amy and, and myself will monitor that. Um, so my first question is geared towards RV. RV, when you hear the word white privilege, what comes to mind? I love the question. And it's one that honestly, it was later in life that I came to fully understand. Um, let me share with you real quickly, for, for a long period of time, uh, I was one of these people that, um, and this came up earlier in one of your slides, Cynthia, you know, I, I've shared with people, my parents were high school dropouts, they got married, <clears throat> my mom was 16 when I was born, my dad was a carpet lawyer, blue collar worker, roof on our head, came home drinking beer every night, often abusive to my mom, and so, I hear white privilege and I come back with everything that I just shared with you. Like I wasn't privileged. This is all what happened in my life growing up. 
anyone and everyone would probably agree that those are very sad um, circumstances, and they are, but they were part of my life. But as I said, it was later that I came to realize that is not one iota of what white privilege is about. That was a lifestyle. White privilege to me, Cynthia, is something that's inherent uh, just because of the color of our skin. It's nothing we do to earn it. It's just there. And um, I, I'd like to cite an example, if I may, thinking on this question. I knew it was directed to me. And I, uh, you know, in my, my time of researching and studying and preparing for this webinar, I thought, what, what recent examples can I come, with, come up with that I can really share about white privilege? Interestingly, interestingly enough, I want to share an example that's almost 50 years ago. Um, I'm in high school uh, in the Dallas Independent School District. Our district had just become integrated. Uh, there were desegregation laws that were passed. And at the time, and I don't know if any of our uh, participants listening in have had this happen in their growing up, but here it was called minority to majority school transfers, where the African-American kids were bused out of South Dallas, where they were a majority, and they were bused across town to the predominantly white schools. Now, looking back on that, it was a very tense time. There were what we call race riots. Neither group was comfortable being together at the outset. Again, a very sad time. But looking back on it, there was such a sense of white privilege then. It's like we're in our same school. We're still being who we are. The minority students had to come, and they're going to have to adapt to us. What, what a uh, huge undertaking. Uh, these kids have been going to school their first eight, nine years, or, you know, first eight or nine grades, and all of a sudden they're put on buses to have to get up early in the morning to be sent across town, and then being asked to acclimate to another group because they're a majority, and they're used to having things their way, and so therefore it's up to, to the new kids to change, uh, which created just all kinds of animosity and hardship. So, you know, that's an example, Cynthia, that I want to pull. That goes way back. But it's so very vivid in my, my childhood and my growing up. Uh, despite some hard circumstances back then, I think I took a lot of lessons from it that have helped shape me as I matured into a young man and now obviously into a much older man. So that's, that's kind of a take on white privilege that I can give you. Thank you, RB. Joyce. Do you have any friends that are allies? And if so, how did they become allies? Absolutely. I have lots of friends and lots of people um, in my life that have affected my life in ways um, that have been probably my most unlikely allies in some cases, you know, um, which are are needed and required when you think about the importance and the intentionality um, that's needed to be an ally. I have had people in my life that have, they've hired me through allies. I've, they've mentored me in allyship. They have um, supported me. They've stood by me. They have made sure I was received equitable um, resources, pay, and opportunity. Um, they promoted me. Um, they gave me a seat at the table and a voice in the room. They've echoed my ideals into success. They've been probably some of my greatest cheerleaders. And I would say that most of my entire venue management experience and just career I've been an only, most of the time, an only either person of color or the person of, of a woman of gender. And to be the only person in the room, um, sometimes it was a college lecture. Maybe it was a leadership, maybe it was at a leadership conference. But it was through the support of my allyship 
you know, that let me know that I was never alone. And it, 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 it gave me the inspiration needed to stand on my own and to know that my voice was respected and needed and required to be in that space. All right, thank you, Joyce. The next question, um, either for RV or for Joyce, um, have you personally seen white privilege used in your workplace? Um, I guess I can go first. You know, my workplace for, as I stated, uh, the better part of the last two decades has, has been at IVM. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this from, from my perspective, obviously it's the only perspective I have. If there has been that, it's, um, um, I, I guess one way to say it is, it, it, it's something that can be done beneath the surface it's not always in your face, um, blatant, that that type of privilege is, is, is just laid out bare. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that does not happen because again, I think there's so many subtleties that can be used when, when it comes to white privilege that um, ways to cloak it, uh, to disguise it almost. And, um, we have currently a workforce, um, I believe we have 23 employees. And I know at this time we have six white males, um, which is roughly a quarter of our workforce, 25% of our workforce. And of course, that's just one aspect of white privilege. That's, that's the hiring, you know, that's the numbers of, of uh, the composition of cultures and ethnicities on our, on our staff. But Joyce might be able to better address that. It might be more obvious and on the surface, uh, perhaps with an example. But as, as far as my um, career, and certainly most recently with the association, it is it has not, you know, been apparent. And again, not to say that it has not taken place. Hey, Cynthia, I I would say absolutely. I have um, seen. And I think just merely the fact that I have been an only, um, when I stepped into these roles, identifies the levels of white privilege. I, I have an executive level team currently that consists of all white males. I have a senior level executive team that consists of two people of color, one male and one female. Um, I can tell you that I have been clearly in a position where I've had people speak through me or around me in my presence, clearly without even looking at me when the person that either asked a question was in charge or in a leadership role was completely ignored. I have had people make assumptions of why I was in the room, ask for a cup of coffee, um, or say they would like a cup of coffee with the expectation I was part of the service team and not part of the leadership team. Um, I am, you know, I'm, I'm a force to, to be reckoned with. I have been raised by um, African-American women mostly. Um, and I have been encouraged to represent my family in a way that we currently hold five generations right now with my grandmother being 99 years old. And there was always the expectation of my family that I would be there, that they had made a way 
and made a sacrifice for me to be in every location at every moment. They're never surprised. They're just proud, but they're never surprised. So I think because of that, I have always taken on a position that I'm supposed to be there and I'm not always surprised when things happen. Or if I do and I'm with my woman tribe, I say, you know, that support, I'm like, this happened, I'm not surprised, we expect you to be there, that's who you are. And, you know, I would, that would be short to say that, um, you know, yeah, we, we all have privilege, right? Sometimes we have privilege because of our education. We have our privilege because of the, our abilities to do versus those that um, have disabilities. Um, we have um, privilege because we are in a position of leadership. And I think it's about what we do with that privilege and how we support those without privilege in each of those circumstances that help us, one, identify what the privilege is and own it, acknowledge it, and then understand that we're gonna be supported or we will support those without that privilege. But yes, I have definitely been in many circumstances where white privilege was beyond obvious. Cynthia, can, can I chime in real quick? Sure. Um, this, this happened last Friday. This was very interesting. Ebony Wilson was in our office uh, to do an interview with me. Uh, it's the first time for me to meet Ebony, and we just had an incredibly wonderful day spending time together. Um, she loved being in the office. I, it was amusing to me. You know, I see the office all the time, but it was almost like she had just gone to Disney World or something. She had her phone out, and she was taking pictures and everything, and we were walking along uh, one side of the wall heading back to the small conference room, and we have a number of posters up on our wall for those of you who, who've been to headquarters. And these posters and, and pictures, and, and, and these capture the, the history of the association um, in the industry. And anyhow, we're walking along, and we get to a couple of photographs that are from 1975, which is near and dear to me because that's the year I graduated high school. And it was a picture of the, um, uh, the association's board of directors. Uh, I'm assuming it was at the annual conference, a uh, picture taken of the board of directors. And it was all, uh, you can guess, 1975, it was all uh, white men safe for one white woman. And underneath that picture was a picture of the spouse's dinner, uh, spouses of the board members. And it was kind of comical because there you had all white women and one white man <laughs> sitting in the middle of all them. And Ebony and I just kind of looked at each other and, um, you know, I know it was what it was to take off of a thing in our association in 1975, I'm going to wager probably did not look too terribly different than many other corporations or associations if they took their board pictures in. Um, but, you know, where we're at now, and I love the word that Julia Slocum uh, uses a lot, and that's the word intentional. And I think if we're going to move beyond white privilege we, we have to be intentional in every one of our actions to, to create this more diverse and inclusive fill in the blank, board of directors for IBM, committees, your workplace, my workplace. So there's, you know, we say this all the time, there is much work to be done, but if we can understand intentionality, we can make some serious inroads and I don't think anyone wants to see a picture like that again. That is clearly not representative of our membership, nor the industry, nor the people who come into our venues. I'd like to expand a little bit. Thank you for sharing that RV and congratulations on to Ebony. Um, Joyce, expand a little bit more on what you were talking about in regards to uh, what what things can those with white privilege do to help those that don't as it relates to the workplace? You know, we can, there are lots of things that we can do. 
Um, and I would start out by saying, um, don't ignore the obvious. If you are in a space and you have an opportunity to provide support, um, an ally is going to do that. An ally is going to not sit in a meeting or amongst their family friends, um, family or friends or in-laws and allow um, disparaging things or conversations to take place without challenging it. They're, you're gonna listen and be a good listener. It may be that, you know, there's someone in the room and, and it's referring to their religion. Maybe they, and if you don't understand it, then, you know, listen to understand. You know, that's allyship. Those are things we can do. We can provide our support. We can echo some of the things that I said before. We can echo when someone is sitting at the table that has a good idea, we can echo and support that good idea. When we see that there may be someone intentional or unintentional, we can step up and be the person to make the change. We can volunteer, we can mentor, we can provide sponsorship, partnership, we can lend our voices, we can we can lend our expertise. We can be the resource. When I talked earlier about, you know, um, you know, allyship in its most um, unlikely places, that's where that's where it happens. It's easy for it to happen, or for you to read about it in a TED talk, or someone else to tell you their story. But we all see it. There's no way that we are not in an environment where these things aren't happening. We may not have been as conscious. You know, the thing that I love about Black Lives Matter is that I understand, I mean, I understand that all lives matter, but if Black lives have to matter too, in order for all lives to matter. So when we hear the words Black Lives Matter, then we have to understand that they have to matter. So they, Black Lives Matter also. Black Lives Matter too. In order for us to move social justice forward, for us to change, to make this world a place better than it was than, than we received it, then we have to understand that those lives, those marginalized lives and people of color or religious or background or gender, those lives have to matter and those voices have to be at the table. And those, when we provide privilege, when we stand in privilege, then we have to make sure that, that we are standing in support and we're being loud. We are standing in our truth and adding truth to power. It is, Cause it's within our privilege that gives us the opportunity to make change. Yes, thank you. So along the lines of Black Lives Matter, uh, again, the word that we're hearing now is ally, allyship. But I've been on several webinars where people have chimed in to say the word ally seems kind of heavy. Um, it feels like it's another title that's been given to me that has a lot of weight to it. What other ways or terms can someone be seen as an ally? You touched a little bit on it, Joyce, um, but what are other ways, if you don't want to use the term ally, that you can sh show that you're being an ally? Um, some of the words that I've already used would be like mentor, right? A mentorship. Um, but but when you mentor someone, you're providing them information, you are sharing experiences with them, you have um, something that you are giving, right? It's an active engagement. And the thing that I love about allyship is that it requires a consistent, active engagement. And so I think that it's just a, allyship to me, it's just a new word for leadership is stepping into a role that says, hey, 
um, I'm here, I see you, I hear you, I support you, I'm there with you. I'm willing to sign the petition. I'm willing to go down and, you know, not just be sort of like this um, inactiveness, right? I, I have gay um, friends or friends in the LGBT community, not just saying, um, oh yeah, I have dinner. But when someone like, like um, RV said earlier, when you're in the presence of someone and they, they make a comment, you stand up and they say, oh, you understand. They didn't really mean that. Um, they didn't, you know, that's just the way that they are. But, you know, he, he's, he's harmless. Well, actually he's harmful in that when we step into our allyship and we have a voice, we lend that voice forward. So you can do that in so many ways. You can be a cheerleader, a supporter, a mentor. You can, um, because it, it does sound or feel heavy today, but I think what we're going to understand is that it's just a new word for something we're already doing and that we already have and we already understand. Sometimes you're an ally and you don't realize you're an ally, but you know you may have a reason to do so. Like for me, I had a stepbrother who in the 70s died in um, back in the 70s and he was part of the LGBT community. And I didn't really understand it as a little girl, but I knew I loved him. And so as an adult and a teenager, having lost a stepbrother, um, I actively got involved in allyship. And I would say, I didn't call it allyship. I just actively got involved in something that meant something to me. And I see it even in my workplace today. We have ERGs. And one of our ERGs is a pride ERG. A second ERG that we have is our um, Spectral Women's Network. And I'm supportive in that. And there are, or we have our, our 100 women um, with IAVM. And how many men are involved in the 100 women that are supporting, you know, the movement of the of women and gender in leadership and in roles and in participation and even in IAVM. So I think that we have a lot of allyship that people didn't realize, oh, wow, I'm already an ally. I'm already stepping into these roles and supporting it with their paycheck, right? With, um, with their vote, in all these ways, we are making a difference. And they're already stepping into those, what looks like big shoes are actually um, standard size shoes. So don't be afraid, people. Great. Um, let's talk, well, we, we have a question that just came into the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and ask that question. Um, for both Joyce and or RV. Um, the, the person is saying, they're interested in hearing a perspective on the thought that Black Lives Matter feels exclusive and can feel offensive to those who are not Black. Is there concern for the perception of hypocrisy in working for equality while using a slogan that singles out a particular race? I, I wanna start with that and I'll, I'll pass it over to you, um, RV. Um, whoever wrote, that I, I appreciate. Thank you for saying what other people are thinking, right? That's the, that's the power to, the um, truth to power. You, you speak up and you say what other people are thinking. Um, I can see why people or some people would say um, that it appears to be creating um, a division or separation. The reason it's important is because it is the Black lives that are having heavy impact. It is the black lives that are being separated. You know, we at once had once in our in our career, I mean, once in this this our lifetime, we had to fight for women's rights, right? So women's rights matter. Black lives matter, women's rights matter. There were rights, but we weren't inclusive of those rights. What we're saying is that society is like a it's, it's a it's like a contract and the contract says that all everyone should be inclusive in that contract 
But when you have evidence that people are treated differently and that privileges are the way in which they see a face to determine an assumption about a particular set of people, then you have to address the marginalization. And that's why I believe that Black Lives Matter, forget the slogan, we are really talking about it's important that Black Lives Matter also. The reason you have to point it out is because it has been separated out and people, in fact, are strictly um, being um, viewed based off of what they see. And so I think that's why we have to address it. And I think that's why we have seen the momentum of Black Lives Matter in RV. I, I, you know, I think you, I think you hit on it. Am I on mute? No, I'm not good. Okay, I had to check that real quick. Um, I think you hit on it uh, really beautifully, Joyce. I really do. And I, I, I've come to an understanding of this. It's, um, you know, you'd made a comment that. Uh, black lives were the last to be uh, included in the contract and and that's 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 a fact um you know if we want to go back to to when civil rights took place when the acts took place in the 1960s it's not that long ago it is but it isn't and you know i cited some examples 10 years after that uh of forced busing uh that's not that long after civil rights this this is all pretty fresh in in our in our history and so it's it goes back to the thing where i shared some of my upbringing and that people would agree that that was probably not an ideal upbringing i had i'm thankful that i was able to to go ahead into a career in everything but um you know it's the same thing whenever the, the, the typical comeback, if you see people on both sides of a protest line, is uh, someone holding a Black Lives Matter sign and someone else holding an All Lives Matter sign. And, and it's the same thing. I know that Black people agree that All Lives Matter. Um, it's come up in this panel. and I, I mean, I think it would come up anywhere. You know, we're all human beings. We're part of the human race. All of our lives matter. So there's agreement on that. But that is is not what these three words are trying to convey or to say. It is to 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 bring the level up to this equality that others have been recipients, inherent recipients. Again, we don't control where we're born, the color of our skin. Only only God does that for us. But you know things out of our control. But these things that we can control, we need to get a better grip on them and and work together toward them or we're just doomed to keep repeating what's been repeated in the past and there are no strides made. How is that good for anyone if no strides are made? It's not. So that's kind of my comment. And thank you for the participant that, that asked that question. It actually leads into uh, one of our questions is that, of course, we hear a lot about Black Lives Matter. What other marginalized groups can we be allies with? There, there are all kinds. If I can, if I can jump out, I know when you presented the questions to us, uh, Cynthia, you pr uh, presented three examples at the end of that question, and um, you know, this you'd mentioned LGBTQ, disabled, and women as the three. I'll just go ahead and share those. It's not like I just came up with them, but th those are three I think obvious marginalized groups that that we can be allies with. Um, and um, you know, there there are different groups with different needs. Let's put it that way. And so, if we can identify they, those groups, I, I personally love the word ally. Uh, as an editor, uh, I hear the word ally, and I immediately come up with the word alongside. 
which is to me who an ally is. It's someone who is alongside me, uh, someone in the trenches with me. I know it has military terminology uh, in everything. We all need allies in our lives. So let's, let's identify those groups. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to jump totally off topic, but I know within our Diversity and Inclusive Leadership Committee, um, Stephanie Tomlin and Ebony Wilson have come aboard and they were very instrumental in starting the Black Resource Group earlier this year. And we've even had discussions within our diversity committee meetings of, of, of looking for these other types of groups. You know, we're not just trying to start it and stop it right here. Um, there are other groups with unique and, and, and special needs that are underrepresented, uh, perhaps discriminated against, and if we can, one, identify them, and two, be an ally to them, as people have been allies to us, it's kind of the paying it forward mantra, which is what we should all live by anyhow. So um, anyhow, there's thoughts on that. Cynthia, and I will say, um, you hit it off, you hit it right, um, RV. Women, um, LGBT community, you know, religious, based off of um, people ethnicity you know veterans can be and you know you can be an ally for let veterans people of color non-binary disabled there's so many groups anything that that is set out and that is separated and marginalization is how you can support it could have a, could have a need for ally i hope i kind of answered that And so talking a little bit about what we do as venue managers, um, what can venue managers, what can we do to support allyship in our venues? May I start again? I know it's not the gentlemanly thing to do. <laughs> Absolutely. You, start, you got my permission. Love you. Bless you. <laughs> now this is fresh. This isn't 50 years ago. This is this morning. So we're going we're, we're, we're at time warp speed. We're moving up to today. I'm, I'm proofreading an article for the November, December uh, venue professional magazine that's written by Hannah Turner uh, at the University of Wyoming. And uh, I love Hannah's column. I'm not going to spoil it because it is the November, December issue, but I will share with you the title of her column was A Tale of Two Supervisors. And she recounts how she has had two female supervisors and how they were just so opposite end of the spectrum from each other. She thought because they were both female, as she was a young professional coming up in the industry, that both would just be welcoming her with, with open arms and that they had this allyship in common of being females. And as she reveals about one, that was the farthest thing from the truth. Uh, <laughs> she got nothing from that. It was a horrible experience. And so, um, you know, fortunately, the story ends well. She, she shares about another supervisor she had who did support her as a young professional and introduced her as a rising young professional in this industry. Some beautiful things. So that's just a quick example. Of, of, of a manager, of a venue uh, manager's impact on a, uh, be it a colleague, be it a, a person that they supervise. Um, but again, being alongside that person, helping that person grow professionally, taking an interest in that person's personal life, you know, without being intrusive, obviously, but just anything that I can help you with or offer suggestions. I'm here for you, that type of thing. So Joyce is probably better equipped being actually in the venue and uh, in someone in a supervisory capacity. So let me pass it to you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I would say that there are so many things we can do um, in our industry. You know, we, the thing that I see most is that people get to a certain level. And I know for me, what one thing that I talked about when I really talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion is that in order to really make, to see a change within our, within a, um, within an organization, you have to be in a, in my opinion, you have to be in a position of power because then it puts you in a, 
a, a, um, in a position to have a voice and then, you know, allow that voice to be, um, you know, pushed out across the organization. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to, to make a significant difference in people's lives. Um, we should look to do that. We should look to educate, to listen, to learn, to promote, to support, and to be the cheerleaders. We should look to do that. We should ask people what they want. Ask your employees, how do they see their future? Um, and then supply them with the resources needed to, um, to help them move forward in that. When we do those things and we force people to, to communicate, to talk, and to put it out there, we learn so much about each other. And things won't feel so foreign. I think what happens is people, instead of projecting what, which is so dangerous, the myth of, you know, black skin is dangerous or um, gay people carry diseases or Jewish people, um, they're cheap, you know, they're fugal. It, instead of carrying those myths, why don't we go into a space to say, tell me about your religion. I don't really know what it is. I only understand the myths. Talk to me about what it means to be Jewish and why you're so prideful. They're very prideful as they should be. But talk to me about that. Why is it so important to, um, to celebrate the holidays um, around um, your religion? Why is that important? Because it helps everyone in the room understand that. When we promote, support, mentor, um, recommend, willing to, um, to change the culture in the workplace, it ultimately changes what happens in our society. And so I think those are just the beginning of the things that we could do to support each other and be allies and change our, not just our workplace, but our world. And we do have another question that's come up in the chat. Amy, are we okay on time to ask, ask a question? Yes, ma'am, we are. Okay. All right. Um, this question comes from Laura. She says, I see performative allyship in a lot of social circles. Many of my friends and colleagues are as left-leaning and progressive as I am. And I know that they, they truly care about what's going on, but not all of them are moved to action. I've had conversations with them trying to recommend ways that they can get involved, but it seems fruitless sometimes. Do you have any suggestions for how to motivate these people into using their available resources to take real action, being a, a performative ally? This is Joy, so I'll, I'll start and um, RV, you can come behind that. And maybe even you, Cynthia, too, you may have some some opportunities. You know, um, people, there are some people that are standing, that are, that are not willing to stand in the gap, or I, I would take it back, that are trying to stand in the gap, but don't know how to stand in the gap. And it's really about understanding information and acknowledgement. So, you know, I, I recommend, you know, links and information. I recommend, you know, stepping outside of yourself, get involved in a, join a group that is, you know, that's, that's part of the, mar the, the marginalized um, group. Because I, I don't believe that those people that are surrounded by um, this diversity of people and is 
truly um, talking and communicating with these people will walk away the, the same as they were when they walked in. And so I think it's, you know, honestly, it's about opportunities of education, you know, links. The more and more that we talk about it, I believe that, that you can inspire someone else to, to make change. So if, I, if people see me making change and doing things that are making change, it inspires others to do the same. And you're not going to win every, you know, not every color in the, you know, in the jar is going to translate to red or blue or whatever the majority of that color is. But it, but it, but if we, if we, I, I always shoot for one. I don't shoot for 15. If I'm in a space, if I make one change, make one person in that space see differently and call and, and they felt cost to, to change in action, then I feel like they will in in turn push out and they will make a connection and and push other people to action. So I think the focus don't need to be about everyone in the room. I think it's about making being who you are, standing up in your truth, and then making and inspiring others. And if you walk away with one person out of that group of 10 that you've, that you've changed and have been able to call to action, I think that, that you'll see that. And, you know, and there are books today, there are links, there are um, information um, to, of, of, for understanding, because I think people are just really looking to understand. That's my opinion on it. RV? Yeah, good stuff. You know, you, you talked about, about some ways there, and, and um, I, I think sometimes it, it, you have to look at a person's personality, too. Um, some people make a commitment, but not a full commitment. It's just kind of like proposing to a lady, and you don't get married to seven years later. You know, I've committed, but I haven't. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think some other ways for this, uh, for some of the, the friends that are being mentioned here, uh, when it is talking about being moved to action, it doesn't have to be, action does not have to be, if, if you wanna say, are you going out um, and peacefully protesting with me? There's various forms of action that a person can, can be a part of. You mentioned some of them with resources and links and books, uh, Joyce, but you know, um, find out some ways you can financially support that's an action if you have the means to do it and you want to make a difference um use use you know use your dollar bills and make that difference um work in communities you know be be a part of uh uh you know communities where there are food banks or something uh communities where there's hardship there's not as many clinics, health clinics, or uh, services that, that people on the other side of town get. So there's different ways of, of uh, becoming active that aren't necessarily what we always think of as, as action. Uh, it's no different than at our, at our church if somebody's going on a missionary trip. I can't go on every missionary trip, but I can support it by my actions with spending funds to allow people to go on that trip uh, and, and to accomplish goals and objectives. So all kinds of ways to, to do action. And some of them may not seem so, um, trying to think of the word here, uh, frightening perhaps or intimidating to your friend um, as a call to be on a front line. Maybe that's something that can be grown into, starting out with some, some other ways of of showing support and being active. So those are just a couple of extra thoughts I'd like to uh, pitch in for that question. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna be mindful of the time. We do have one more question that I would like to, to ask of the panelists. Um, I, I see a few people are needing to log out, completely understand we have back-to-back -back webinars and Zoom meetings that we're a part of. Um, but I wanna ask this question that came in. It says, I apologize. 
So often we hear that there is a need to be intentional when diversifying staff, particularly by hiring more people of color. However, I've noticed diversifying the people at the table does not always equate to allowing for diverse, diverse voices or perspectives. How do you suggest being intentional, but always also purposeful? Great question. Wonderful question. Um, I, I, I can answer. I, th this question, the first thing I thought of was when I interviewed um, Kim Stone, who is now at Chase Center uh, with the Golden State Warriors. At the time, she was at American Airlines Arena uh, in Miami. Many of you know Kim, and she is a true champion for, for many of these diversity initiatives that we've talked about. This probably wasn't her original saying. It was somewhat new to me to hear when she said it's one thing to be asked to the dance, and it's another once you're at the dance to be asked to get on the floor. And so I really equate that. That's the same. It's like, okay, we, you know, IBM, you've got six white guys on a staff of 23. Clearly, you're diversifying your staff. The other 18 people are sitting at this table. Do they have voices or perspectives at this table? Or is it just something you can put in a stat sheet to tell members you've got this great blend of diversity? You have to open it up. You have to give people the space to speak and to have their opinions count. It has to be more than lip service. Um, every individual, every individual at that table has something to bring to that table or they wouldn't be working with you. They wouldn't be hired in the first place. So, you know, I think part of intentionality is exactly that word. You know, I intentionally want to give you the opportunity to make a difference in, in, in our workplace. And, um, you know, if you do that in your workplace, by the time you leave that office, you're probably going to go out into the world and do some of those same things yourself. And how much better does that become for everyone? So that would be a, a comment from me. And Cynthia, um, I won't take long here, but I will say that you're correct in that diversity used to be in numbers and it was focused on numbers. Today, diversity is focused on intentionality and a diversity of actual voice and intention. And without the diversity of my mind and my thoughts, you cannot have my diversity. So what I will wrap up in saying is that, you know, it's, you're right, it's no longer about, it's no longer about um, what you see in, in pie charts. Those charts are important because they, they lend to where you're really is holding data accountability. But honestly, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And so for me, diversity is you have to be willing to step up and face the change and expect diversity of voice. Yes, and to tag on to that, I would also say that if you're bringing those persons to the table, allow for a space for them to feel comfortable to speak as well as be heard. And that it's not something, an opinion. I've, I've actually sat on tables where I gave a suggestion and the next day my boss said it and everyone thought it was great. But when I said it, there was nothing. No movement was made on it. And my boss being a white male. So um, making sure that, that that table is saying everyone's opinion matters. Before I close every meeting, I always go around the table or around the Zoom camera now with all of my staff making sure that I've heard from every voice in my department. So with that, um, we can talk about this, I'd say for another hour, but thank you so much for logging in and for joining us. Um, I've shared within the chat, um, there is a group um, that's, that's for white allies for black lives. Um, if you'd like more information on their group, it's called showingupforsocialjustice.org, white people for black lives. 
check them out. Joyce is a TED Talk <laughs> addict. <laughs> so she has wonderful TED Talks that she's she had been sharing with me. So I wanted to make sure that I share those in the chat. Um, so check out those as it relates to uh, white privilege or the one-sided, this danger of a single story was moving. Uh, we have a, a panelist for Venue Connect that will talk a little bit more about that. And let's continue to have these, these honest dialogues. Um, thank you again, uh, IAVM Foundation, for allowing us to have this conversation on behalf of Ebony Haddis, who is the chair of the Diversity and Leadership Committee, and myself, vice chair, and all of our 26 members that represent the diversity of our industry. We thank you very much. And um, again, thank you, RV, and thank you, Joyce. We apologize again that we weren't able to see your faces. We heard what you what you were saying. We heard it, and I will turn this over to Amy. May I may I close with a fast comment? This is this is a elevator speech, really quick. Of uh, course, RV. This, this this is for me personally. You just mentioned the committee, and I said at the outset, I'm the staff liaison to the committee. Um, folks, this is why it's important for us to all get together and, and speak about these crucial conversations. I thought as a staff liaison that I had been doing this committee a favor, um, you know, being the, the mediator, going back and forth to headquarters with needs from the committee, taking notes. But the longer I have been in this role, the more this committee has done me a favor in growing me as a person that I, that I otherwise would not have had at least in this circle of being able to talk to these 26 wonderful people and to hear them speak from the heart. So I thank this committee for all their work and anything you can do who are still on this uh, webinar, do support the committee because they're doing great things. Thank you. Thank you for that shameless plug. And also as it relates to Venue Connect, if you haven't registered already, I'm not employed by IAVM, but we're going to have some really great dialogue also on diversity on our various tracks. So please, um, we will continue this conversation. And once again, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Cynthia, RV, and Joyce. And I appreciate everyone um, sticking around with us through the technical difficulties that Zoom is evidently having today. Um, I just want to remind everyone, again, as Cynthia just stated, if you've not already registered for Venue Connect um, 2020 virtual, please do so. There's so much uh, in our education sessions and networking sessions that we'll be offering even more of these types of conversations, as well as we will be doing our annual campaign for diversity and, and inclusion leadership um, committee um, for scholarships. So we wanna make sure that everyone is signing up and are planning on attending, and we appreciate you each month coming back and joining us for the E3 conversations. Look for um, the next one in your email within the next couple of weeks so that we can continue on with these wonderful open dialogues that our committee and our foundation are offering us. Thanks again um, to Cynthia, Joyce, and RV for your time today. We really appreciate you. And thank you everyone for joining. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. My pleasure. Thank you all. Honor, honor to be a part. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Cynthia and Amy. Appreciate it, you guys. I'm signing off. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.